we're privileged to have the opportunity to consider together the messages given this last weekend in the international training for elders and responsible ones in the Lord's recovery. The general subject of this training is knowing, experiencing, and living the all-inclusive Christ. Knowing, experiencing, and living the all-inclusive Christ for the genuine church life. We'll be on message one, which will serve the literary function as if it were an opening paragraph of a book, or the first sentence of a paragraph. Message one serves to introduce to us this all-important subject. And you'll find with the other messages that they all add definition and enlargement to the crucial crystallized point of this message. And so our title is being brought back to Christ himself, the genuine church life. So this Christ, to whom we're to be brought back for the genuine church life is the all-inclusive Christ. How significant it is that in 1962, beginning the present phase of universal spread of the Lord's recovery over the entire earth, for the Lee framed this advance with his speaking on the all-inclusive Christ based on Deuteronomy chapter eight, showing how in typology, the good land, Israel, the promised land, was to God's people be, to be where they lived, where they obtained their sustenance, where they had all their needs supplied, and where they dedicated their lives. Now in way of fulfillment, after the New Testament reiteration of this, of this Old Testament major all-inclusive type of Christ as the all-inclusive good land, the apostles, as we'll see, labored to bring us into this all-inclusive experience of Christ by bringing us back from everything in our daily life in which we do not have purposeful, intended, invited involvement of the Lord himself into our daily living, which by doing so brings us also simultaneously into him, to live in him, to have him as our everything. Dear brothers and sisters, the cry of the universe, the inquiry of our God, our purposing God, would we, yourselves as young adults, take this as a life calling. Many of you are professionals. You have areas of expertise, specialization, certification. You've dedicated your lives in a certain direction. Superseding and transcending all of that is that in your lifetime, you would be brought back from everything else that does not have in your registration Christ subjectively, experientially, present with you in your own registration, in your own frame. Be rescued back from that to a point where, because you love him, because you desire to touch him and enrich every experience of yours with him, 
that you get brought back from all of those experiences in which you're distracted from his presence, distracted from direct involvement in touch with him. And so to this, this outline, this message, and to this, this series of messages is dedicated. And we'll see in this outline and in those messages that follow that when we give ourselves to be rescued, retrieved, called back, and brought back from every distracting thing, then the Lord has a genuine church life with us. And collectively speaking, he would have this over the earth. And such a genuine church life would be body life, the body in reality, and we give the Lord the way to based upon our having him as everything, have us join him in the heavenly Mount Zion. As in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And from there, enjoy the events at the end of the age and the coming age. <clears throat> well, let's go through this outline <clears throat> and hopefully it will inspire us to have a new livelihood, a new view of our life as young adults. How about dedicating your life, your personal aspiration to within your profession, within your married life, and within your church life, be brought back to Christ experientially in every single thing that you do, touch, and say. We'll see this in these messages. Roman number one says, <clears throat> we, believers in Christ and children of God, need to be freed from all distractions and brought back to Christ himself. Ephesians 3.8 tells us that this Christ is unsearchably rich. Any experience of ours that is not with him experientially involved is one in which we sacrifice those riches and need to be brought back from distractions to enjoy him as these riches. And as we do eventually, he becomes our very universe in which we can live as seen in these verses. <clears throat> the word distractions here refers not necessarily to bad or evil things, but refers to anything that's important enough to us that related to that thing and in the experience of that matter, we lose our bearings, we lose our touch, we lose our beholding, our face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact with the Lord, which he would like to have us carry forth in everything so that he could live together with us and us together with him. Anything that distracts us is that which prevents us from giving full attention to him first. And then in our attention with him first, we together, the two of us, an emerged, mingled, living sense, can as one joined person then have that otherwise priceless experience. Now, as part his riches, enjoying his riches. So A tells us God wants Christ to be the center of all things and have the first place in all things. Christ being all and in all. So the reference verse here <clears throat> is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. And here we see in this marvelous book, 
that simultaneously presents Christ as the head of the body and also presents him as the all-inclusive good land in verse 12 as our portion. But he is the one who is to have the first place, to be preeminent, and to be the one who in our personal universe is the source of everything is the one who holds everything together, is the one onto whom everything is directed. Is this too much? Oh no, it's not too much. This unsearchably rich Christ wants our very living and our being to be brought into the unsearchable dimensions of him as a territory for our living, as signified by the good land in Colossians. When we live there with him, as we advance in this way, we arrive eventually at Colossians 3, 10, and 11, where he eventually is all and in all, all and in all. And we are now the body, one new man, and the bride. B says, Christ is wonderful. How much have you attained in your young adult life? I'm guessing that many of you are quite accomplished and all of you are quite uh, diligent in pursuing of your careers, supporting your families, doing many things. Let me propose the most worthwhile thing to adorn your young adult human life with is to make Christ be so wonderful to you. To make him be incomparable to you through his word and through the ministry in the Lord's recovery, through the fellowship among the churches in the Lord's recovery. You see glimpse after glimpse of him. You touch him in new ways. You bring him into new experiences of yours in your daily living and you realize he is wonderful. I'd encourage you to make this the endeavor, the achievement the goal you set for yourself in your young adult life. Every item of what he is, is wonderful. Point C says God's will, which is his eternal purpose and desire in the universe, is that Christ be everything to you, to us, and be brought into us as our life and everything. He wants to be brought into us as our life and our everything so that in our daily living, we can by applying him, by touching him and by enjoying him, make him everything, not just in our being, but in our daily living itself. And as such, our living is one will contribute to the end of the age. Paul was for this. He says Paul wrote his epistles because he was clear that many good things, such as doctrines, ethics, morality, teachings, culture, are distractions from Christ. So he wrote to the believers there in the first generations of the New Testament age. Telling, telling those in Galatia, oh, don't let the law distract you from Christ. Telling those who received the book of Hebrews, don't let your background in Judaism distract you from Christ. Those in, in Colossae, don't let Gnosticism and earthly wisdom and philosophy distract you from Christ. To the believers in Corinth, don't let gifts, wisdom, and physical prowess Distract from Christ. In Ephesians, don't let the winds of teaching keep you from holding Christ as your reality. Hold to him in love. So eventually, in Philippians chapter 3, in verses 4 through 8, he counted all the things that he had achieved. In all the above areas, he had excelled and distinguished himself. 
all men will know Christ. Now he determined that if he would be among the Jews, he would not be so without the experience of Christ. He would not touch anything philosophical apart from Christ. Nothing of the church life, nothing of spiritual gifts apart from Christ himself. And he considered all these distracting things as what? As rubbish, as dog food. He let them all go. And he stretched forward to what? He stretched forward to experiences in which he would be rescued from every distraction and bring Christ with him into the experience of those very things. This, dear brothers and sisters, is the worthy life goal is being set before us in message one of this training. So point one says the Apostle Paul shows that these things are not Christ himself and indicates that, listen now, if they distract us from Christ, they are versus Christ. So 1 Corinthians 7.35 urges us to be rescued from anything and everything, including our married life, marriage life, that could otherwise distract us from Christ. Good things, eventually, or evil things, certainly in terms of morality or good or evil. But a good thing becomes a problematic matter if we touch that good thing apart from our joining with him, viewing him, touching him in our mingled spirit concurrently with that experience and in that experience and taking us through that experience from beginning to end until that experience is brought into Christ, is brought into him as the good lamb, is contained in Christ. And there's nothing about our experience of that thing that does not have the taste, the flavor, the reality of Christ himself. Point D2 says, when we turn away from all distractions and turn to Christ, will be brought back to Christ himself so that we may know him in a new way in that experience, experience him in a new way in that experience, and have that experience and now be part of a new living, a new living, which is in the all of Christ. As such, we enjoy him, enjoy Christ, we express him, are constituted with him because when we touch him and involve ourselves with him in an experience of ours, that contact with him in our mingled spirit opens the floodgates of our inner being, the, the um, interface between our soul, capable and allowed to, authorized to live independently. Our soul turns and becomes our turning heart to touch him in our spirit. And this opens this interface floodgates and he floods into our inner being and brings us into he himself as the all inclusive Christ. This is possible in every one of our experiences and brings all of our experiences into the heavens and into him as our good land. E. In Philippians 3, 13 through 16, Christ is presented as the goal of the believer's pursuit. So a pursuit is something vigorous. We believers, as we see in Hebrews chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, are on a long-term race course. We're pursuing Christ. Does that take us away from our daily living or from our professions or from our marriages? No. We pursue as a dedicated runner would 
to bring to our experiences our conjoined experience of Christ and our mingled spirit. And to bring our and to bring that experience into Christ. This is the goal. This is our pursuit. This is what Paul pursued. As such, in every experience of ours, we enjoy him. And we express him because our contact with him brings him into us in the midst of our daily living and allows him to show forth as the testimony of Jesus. Allow us to participate in that. Step point one says, an account of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Paul counted all things to be lost. This is the objective knowing of Christ that we have from his word and from the ministry. So we pursue aggressively his word, seeking to meet him in his word and bring that touch with his word also into him in our experience. But as we touch him in the word, passage after passage opens up and we see a new glimpse of the excellent Christ. Even more, when we touch the ministry as it pertains to a certain part of the Bible, it shows us as would a tour guide, this picture of Christ, that picture of Christ that might be hidden or camouflaged, that isn't so easily seen. And as we spend our time in the word and in the ministry, oh, he becomes our Lord. The excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And from there, excellent experience of Christ in Philippians 3.8 allows us to begin to know him, Philippians 3.10, in all of our varied daily experiences. Two, Paul suffered the loss of all things encountered them refuse in order to gain Christ. Now, <clears throat> does that mean that Paul <clears throat> discarded everything? He was professionless? No, he made tents. No, he still, he still was able to, to speak and serve and do all the things that he did in his human life. Here, to count all things as loss is to count all things that are Christless as loss. Even those good things, laudable things, accomplished things that we're proud of, that did not involve the subjective touch with it. This is what it is. This is what it is to count all things as loss. To count something as loss if we fail to bring Christ into that experience and bring that experience into Christ as our good name. Three, Paul's earnest desire was to be found in Christ. Oh, to be found in him. In Philippians 3, 9, he longed in that prison. Chapter 1, verse 20, uh, in nothing to be put ashamed, to, to be put to shame but always to magnify Christ. Verse nine, to have the observing eyes of the universe, the observing angels, to find him in touch with the indwelling Christ and his mingled spirit so that every experience of his would be a joint experience of he and Christ, Christ and he in that daily living experience. He wanted to be found in him, and that was his subjective righteousness in verse 9. So he might have had his own righteousness if he had accomplished something laudable apart from Christ, but that would have been his righteousness. Paul did not want to be found in his righteousness. He wanted to be found in subjective righteousness of the experience of Christ by initiating, sustaining, and completing experiences in his living touch. Paul 5, excuse me, 4, the necessary condition of being found in Christ is no longer having our, our own righteousness, but the righteousness of God through faith, that is through experiential touch with Christ, 
causing our organic union with him that was established at the time of our regeneration to be an experiential, present, affectionate union with him in that daily life experience. Point five, Paul aspired to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. So, in his daily living, he was never there in himself, in his own righteousness, but he was, he was touching Christ in his organic union, and as such brought into resurrection in the midst of the fellowship of his sufferings there in the jail. Or in your personal circumstances, which certainly by definition involves some suffering, he wants you in, though, in that suffering situation to touch him in his living within you, to touch him in his organ organic union with you in your mingled spirit and cause you to have fellowship with him in your situation and to be brought out of yourself into resurrection in that situation thus knowing him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, having been conformed to his death, which means that as you touch him, you're very otherwise active, you're very otherwise productive natural being, no longer is active, doing something apart from him. Now your whole being has joined him in your daily living. What a life calling is ahead for you, saints. What a life calling. Six, under E, in Philippians 3.10, Paul speaks of being conformed to Christ's death. This indicates that he desired to take Christ's death as the mold of his life. I've said something about this. The mold of his life refers to in the various and multiple experiences of his daily living. That's his life. He wanted his natural being, apart from his present experiential, sensed, perceived, conscious union with Christ, to have that experience brought into that perception, that presence, that consciousness of Christ, and as such, and as such, have his natural being be left. On the cross, terminated with the cross, in the mold of his death. He seven says, Paul experienced Christ as a drink offering and became a drink offering that was poured out on the sacrifice and service of the saints' faith. And here we have the two verses that refer to Paul's experience of being a drink offering, 2 Timothy 4, 6 and Philippians 2, 17. Paul was poured out as a drink offering near and at the time of his, of his martyrdom upon the offering of the faith to your saints. Paul was matured by that time. He'd finished his course. He'd run the race. He was matured in life. And by an experience after experience, pursuing Christ as his goal, touching him in his mingled spirit in the midst of that of that experience. He, as I mentioned earlier, opened the floodgates, the portal of his mingled spirit and inner being interface and allowed Christ as the new wine to flow into his inner being, to saturate his inner being, being his enjoyment and saturating him, becoming his own constitution and causing him in his maturity to be someone who was filled with Christ and who could be poured out as a mature drink offering on the offering of the faith of the saints who came be behind him. Becoming to them an example, a pattern of a, a victorious running of the race in which we're filled with Christ as the, as the new wine to pour out on the sacrifice of the saints, of, of the saints who learned by observing us to live in the same way, pursuing Christ by bringing him into every experience being brought back to Christ and being rescued from every distraction. Point F says, thus, 
We need to see a heavenly vision of God's intention. We speak of God's intention. We speak of the dispensing of God into man as the focal point of his economy for the carrying out of his intention, his eternal purpose and his will. But we need to see that for God to fulfill his eternal purpose, Christ has to come to be everything to us. Not by decision merely, not by revelation merely, not by agreement merely, but through revelation, through agreement, and through decision to remediate every life experience of ours, bring it back to Christ as we're in that experience, touching him in our mingled spirit and causing us and Christ and that experience to become one entity and bring that experience into the all inclusive of Christ as the good land and bring our entire living into the fulfillment of the greatest type of the Old Testament. You know, in Colossians 1, 12, it says that Christ is our portion, indicating he's our allotted portion of the good land. Galatians 3.14 says that that portion is now the blessing of Abraham, the all-inclusive spirit, as our present reality of the good land, now dwelling in our mingled spirit. So now, after that, Colossians 2.6 says, as therefore you have received the Christ, Jesus the Lord, so also in your daily living, walk in him. Meaning that in your daily experiences that compose that walk, you come to your spirit and you touch him as the blessing of Abraham, the all-inclusive Christ, the good land in your spirit. And you bring that experience and your, your, your inner being into the all-inclusive Christ. This and only this will fulfill God's intention. That Christ becomes everything to us in all of our experiences in this way. So point one says, if we receive mercy and grace from the Lord, we'll be able to drop all the good things, even the best things, and stretch forward to lay, lay hold of Christ himself. Again, I point out that in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, these good things, these great things, these best things that Paul set behind him doesn't mean that they were excluded and banished. It meant that he would never touch them again apart from experiential touch with, touch with Christ simultaneously. He touched them, touch Christ together. He stretched forward to have new experiences to be mingled with Christ in this way, causing him to be the master, builder, the architect. That could, that could craft the experience of Christ that would bring forth the body of Christ. F2 says, we need to pray that Christ will be everything to us in our daily life. Now, there's a bit of a play on words here. We need to pray that Christ will be everything in our daily life so we could include as a prayer item, oh Lord, I want you to be everything in my daily life. That's the first significance. The significant second significance of this is to apply in our daily living, living Christ by 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, unceasingly pray. The way for us to take Christ as everything in our daily living is to pray, to bring ourselves out of ourselves into touch with him, silently perhaps, vocally when we can, but silently perhaps, in the midst of an experience. And that brings Christ into, our, into that experience and us into Christ in that experience through our prayer. And he becomes an ingredient, the ingredient, the factual ingredient, the eternal ingredient in that experience. So in these two senses, we need to pray that Christ be everything to us in our daily life. A, as we are doing various things, we should apply Christ. How? Pray the prayer of fellowship. Oh, Lord, 
the prayer of beholding in Psalm 27, 4, of inquiring, beholding and inquiring, beholding his beauty, inquiring of him in, in the temple, inquiring of him of everything in our daily living. These become the prayers, prayers to cause Christ to be everything to us in our daily living and thus cause us to be those who at the end of the age fulfill his eternal purpose. Point out. B. Andrew 2 says, every day we need to pray for new experiences of Christ. And as I said, every day it brings new experiences as we pray, touching him in those experiences. Those experiences are new. He is new. He's never experienced that before, that experience of yours. You've never experienced him in that experience before. And so you enable him to have an experience that the eternal Christ has never had before. And you have an experience of the eternal Christ that no one has had before by taking hold of that experience of yours in your daily living and touching him in the midst of it and being brought back to him, freed from otherwise distracting things. When we do this, oh, brothers and sisters, he has the genuine church life, the church life you long for, the church life that's there in the churches in the Philippines, but can be even more uplifted. The genuine church life is what will spontaneously result as we explore this kind of daily living, being brought back to Christ in everything. So let's go on to Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two reads, the issue are, are being brought back to Christ himself in everything is the genuine church life. We have key verses here regarding the church in the various localities in, in the New Testament. Hallelujah for our local church life, the church in our locality where we live. A says, the genuine church life is Christ realized, experienced, and expressed by all the saints in a corporate way. Oh, so we all have this vision, all have the same occupation, profession, all have the same endeavor. We're reaching out toward the same thing. The church life will spontaneously reach maturity, a wonderful level in our locality. The church life has been said should be 95% of our daily life. So the daily living we've talked about, that I've talked about in Roman number one, where, where we bring Christ into all the experiences. Now, beginning with our spouse, with our meeting in our home, with, with our children, with our group meeting, our small group meeting, with our district meeting, with our special meetings, the ministry meetings, with the meetings on the Lord's Day, the Lord's table meeting, the prophesying meeting, the prayer meeting. In all these meetings, we touch him. And bring him into our experience of those meetings. And those meetings then are meetings that transpire with all inclusive Christ and are supplied by the riches of the good land labored on by us, as we'll see in the subsequent message in this series. Sub point one says God planned the church for the purpose of expressing Christ. Thus, the church is the expression of Christ through our endeavor to be brought back to Christ in everything in the church life. The church life isn't a place for believers who want to meet together to simply have a social or communal church life. It is that, of course. But that becomes disappointing, that becomes weak, that becomes futile if we don't touch Christ in it. And then through that touch, day by day in the church life, oh, when we come to the Lord's table on the Lord's day, we're filled with the riches of Christ to offer to the Lord for his praise in the Lord's table and to the Father for his, re for his uh, remembrance as we worship the Father. So point 208, the church life is nothing other than the all-inclusive Christ with his unsearchable riches, experienced and enjoyed by us and expressed through us in all localities in the North Island, in the South Island, all these many, many, many churches that the Lord has, has built up in the Philippines, making it such a rich 
cradle of life in, in, on the earth in the Lord's recovery. As, as all the saints in each locality are rescued from distractions in their church life and are in their mingled spirit in all of the engagements, all the encounters, all the meetings of the church life. Oh, what a body life that will be. The Lord will not be able to, other than rapture these mature ones. Three, if we would have such a church life, we need to be constituted with Christ until all that we are and have is simply Christ himself who is all and in all. This is the essence and the substance of the church life. How do we get transformed? How do we get constituted? How do we get matured? How does the bride make herself ready? It's by our saying yes to our beloved bride who awaits us, wanting to encounter us and embrace us in our mingled spirit. When we turn him and say, yes, Lord, I love you. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I embrace you too. I contact you. As I said, this gives him permission to exit merely our spirit and to enter into our entire inner being. Saints, this dispensation is for us to have Christ be everything to us and us to be brought fully back to Christ. This age began, we can say, with his resurrection. In his resurrection, after being made the firstborn son of God, and after becoming the life-giving spirit, he what? He regenerated us. And he brought our spirit into himself, the all-inclusive one. Now he, the all-inclusive Christ, at the beginning of the age, included the spirits, all, all the believers, to the regeneration in his resurrection described in 1 Peter 1, 3. What has the rest of this age been waiting for? The rest of this age has been an inquiry to every, every man, really, and every believer for sure, and now us in the Lord's recovery. Will you allow your spirit, which is now within him as the all-inclusive one from the time of his resurrection, to be accompanied by the rest of your inner being, by your contacting him in your mingled spirit? As he does that, he's released into your inner being to become your constitution. And that release of him brings that part of your being into him as he has entered into you. And more and more and more and more, you are brought into the all-inclusive Christ, allowing him, as it relates to you, to actually be all-inclusive. If we're short of this and we don't do this, he may be all-inclusive to others. He may be all-inclusive to all of our spirits. But he's not all inclusive to us until in our love for him and our wanting to bring him into all of our experiences, we touch him in all of our life experiences, allow him to enter into our being and live there with us in that experience, in that experience, and through that experience, be brought more into him as an all inclusive good land, the all inclusive Christ. We need to be brought back to him. Saints, what is the Lord's recovery? The first point. First point of the Lord's recovery is the recovery of Christ as our everything. This message is central to our attaining to the full experience of the Lord's recovery. Brought back from every distraction to Christ Himself, we are the principle of His recovery, we carry forth and testify of His recovery. Now, point B under two. The genuine church life is the life of Christ himself. Christ himself living out of us. Colossians 3, 4, Christ our life. One, the genuine church life is not a matter of teaching or doctrine. Rather, it is a life in which Christ himself is realized, experienced, 
enjoyed, expressed, and exhibited by us through our affection for him, cleaving to him, calling on him, praying at every time, Ephesians 6.18, until he and we, we and he live together, and he genuinely is our life, Colossians 3.4. Then he has the church life. Sub point one, or sub, sub point two, the genuine church life can be realized only by the experience of Christ in our daily life. Now, C under Roman numeral two, the way to realize the church, genuine church life is to experience Christ as everything to us. Our verses here, he is dwelling in us. Colossians 1.27, Colossians 2.17, we take him as the body of all the shadows, which means in our daily experiences, we realize those experiences are simply to cause he and we, we and he, to encounter one another, to be joined and experience. And when we, when we do this, this is the genuine church life. He is everything to us. So point one, the genuine church life comes from the genuine inner enjoyment of Christ. Oh, saints, don't you love him? Don't you enjoy him? In this verse, as we love him and love him and enjoy him, he makes his home in our hearts. Then in verse 17, in verse 18, he's brought us into himself as the all-inclusive one whose dimensions are universal. And in verse 19 and 20, he has, he has church life fully in glory. Three, under C, in order to have, have a church life to express Christ according to God's eternal purpose, our soul must be subdued and saturated with Christ as the Spirit. So we've spoken about this already, but our soul has a chance, opportunity, and offering and authorization to live independently in the various experiences of our daily living. If we do so, Christ who only comes in by invitation, only allows us to have a mingled living when we desire and initiate that, is left aside, waiting, wanting, observing, grieved. So <clears throat> we say no to that, right? Until, as in 2 Corinthians, sorry, it's, yes. <clears throat> In, in 2 Corinthians uh, 3.17, we enjoy him. We enjoy him as the indwelling Christ in everything. He says, the genuine church life requires us to take up our cross and follow him. This is referred to in Matthew 10.38. Some point say, we, his believers, were crucified with Christ. Now, we must bear the cross. What is the cross that we bear? The cross that we bear is aromatic, is lovely. The cross that we bear is ours when we follow him. Where is he? He's in the heavens praying and praying in our spirit, waiting for us. So where do we follow him? We, the way we follow him to the heavens is by coming to him and following him to our spirit. So as we call on him and touch him, we're taking up our cross, which is applied to our living apart from him, our natural living. And we follow him into our spirit. And there we live the church life in the all-inclusive Christ. D2 says, the self must be crossed out so that Christ can come to be the reality of the church life. If you are living in the church life, if I am living in the church life, our church, church life honeymoon will not last long. We know this, right? Why do we have problems in the church life? Unforgiven offenses, disappointments. Why do some go away? It's because they and we, those who we are with, live in our natural constitution, in our natural life. 
So the cell, natural life, needs to be crossed out. Is this painful? No, it's not painful. The cross isn't mainly to not do something that you want to do. It's not mainly to be deprived of something. It's not mainly to give in to others. That is what we call asceticism. That's what we call behavioral modification. That's what we call being, quote, humanly speaking, magnanimous, giving way to others. No! The way to cross out the self is to come and see him. Touch him. The marvelous one. The wonderful one. The God of the universe who's processed to indwell. Who is portrayed to us in our daily experiences. Through the realities, the shadows that are around us of him. Who's portrayed to us in the word. And he's the reality of everything there, according to Luke chapter 24. As we come and touch him, the cross is applied to all the fallen elements of our self. The God-created elements of our self become simply faculties for this new, joined, mingled person to live, live out through. God's eternal intention is worked out in the church and the church becomes the testimony of jesus three there's no other way to realize the genuine church life but to deny our natural life and the soul life and to follow the lord where into and in our spirit we joined him first then we step into activities we step into our married life we step into conversations we step into our professional involvements always joining ourselves with him in our spirit. You say, how do we do this? We do this by sustaining and maintaining our consciousness of him. As we converse with him, as we breathe him in with our calling prayers, as we apply him by seeing how he is represented in our surroundings, and those representations bring us into touch with him. We have experience after experience. that are joined to him and are brought into another quality. Deny our soul life, our natural life, follow the Lord. Living in our experiences. Aren't you glad that you're a young adult at this time? Here at the end of the age? Most of your counterparts worldwide are anxious, wondering what's going to become of them, what's going to become of the earth, taking up this cause or that cause, which they won't be able to help anyway. These problems are insoluble. You can have as your cause to forge a life brought back to the all-inclusive Christ. And bring your daily living into him. This is the burden of this series of messages. This is the burden of this message. This is the, burden, the Lord's burden for your life. This is your commission. This is your calling. This is the only thing that will make you happy. He says, the genuine church life is through the inner experience of the indwelling Christ. These verses here are very familiar. We've referred to most of them already. One, the entire New Testament is filled with the revelation of the indwelling Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Romans 5.10, much more were saved in his life. Galatians 1.15 and 16, he revealed himself into us. Galatians 2.20, he lives in us. Galatians 4.19, he's being formed in us. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, we can call upon his name now in every place as parts of the church whose nature and element is God, the church of God. We can be brought in, we've been placed into him to experience him as our righteousness, as our holiness, as our redemption. 
We can now live him out. Philippians 1, 20 and 21, magnifying him. And we can enjoy him by coming to him in his indwelling. He's our hope of glory, living in our mingled spirit. Colossians 1, 27. Two, in Ephesians 3, 16 through 21, Paul prayed that we would be strengthened with power into the inner man with the result that Christ would make his home in our heart and thereby occupy, possess, permeate, saturate our whole being with himself. So we pray this prayer every day, every morning. Oh, Father, strengthen me with power into my inner man so I can touch my dear Lord Christ as the Spirit. And he then, through my touch, is released into my inner being to make home in my hearts so that we, corporate all the saints, can pursue together his breadth, his height, his length, his depth, and to know the knowledge surpassing love of Christ. Three, when Christ is able to make his home in our hearts, occupying all the inward parts of our being, we will be able to have the genuine church life. Not because we figured it out. Not because we had the best coordination. Not because we're better than others. Spontaneously. And our love for him, our cleaving him, our touch with him, spontaneously we have this genuine church life. Now, um, we'll conclude now with the final two points. F, in order for us to have the genuine church life, we need to experience and enjoy all the riches of Christ. So we're brought back to the beginning. This good land, Christ, is filled with riches, unsearchable riches. He, as our good land now, needs to be our it needs to be with us as our enjoyment. We need to labor on this land and enjoy him in all of our life experiences until our life is filled with and manifests his unsearchable riches. Sub so point one, the genuine church life is not an organization. It is in our spirit, which is nourished with the riches of Christ until we are filled unto all the fullness of God. As we saw both, we see this both in Philippians 3.8 and then later on in 3.18-20. Two, the genuine church life is a corporate life of seeking believers, seeking together. Don't you want to seek together? Seek together as the young adults in the Philippines and over the whole earth. Seeking believers who are filled with the riches of Christ and all the fullness of God. That is on all the expression of the triune God. We've mentioned this also already. Three, it is through the inner experience of the indwelling Christ that we apprehend with all the saints the unlimited measurements of Christ and have the genuine church life for the building up of the body of Christ. Oh, saints, every day, every day we should see that we are in Colossians, um, that we are in Ephesians 3.18. That we are in Colossians uh, 1 12, 1 16 through 19, 1 15 through 19, 2 16 through uh, 19, where we see, where we see that uh, we have Christ as our universe, Christ as our realm, and we bring our experiences of our daily living into that realm. We bring our married life into that realm. Bring our parenting, every interaction with our children into that realm. It changes everything. By our contact with him, he lives in us, constitutes us, transforms us, matures us, prepares us to be his bride, and brings us into himself, of course, into him. Have our life in him, have a living in him as the divine and mystical realm. Then, experiences of our daily life build up the new creation as the spiritual world that he is building up. 
reference chapters, chapters one and two of the crystallization study of Song of Songs. Four under F. If all experience and enjoy the riches of Christ, the genuine church life as the fullness, the expression of Christ will be produced spontaneously. So saints, all this we have in Roman number two is an incentive to cause us not to miss the Lord in our mingled spirit in any experience of our daily living from morning till night. We're in the church life where we can remind one another. Some of us will be better than others at this. Those who are better can remind those and serve as patterns to those who are coming behind. Those who aren't so advanced can notice and aspire and try every day to bring more experiences through their mingled spirit into the divine, divine and mystical realm of the experienced Christ, the all-inclusive Christ is their good lady. And the genuine church life will come forth. This will be the body life with this reality as the one new man to be the prepared bride to cause the rapture of the believers. This is how we hasten the Lord's return. Now we'll conclude with point G. All the saints need to experience something of Christ in their daily living and come together with the Christ whom they've experienced. Exhibit this Christ to share him with one another and to enjoy him with God the Father for his pleasure. This is the genuine church life. We'll see this also, and if, if, if you cover all, if we're covering all eight messages, this is message seven of this series of eight messages. And it shows that what's been belonging in Brother Lee's heart and Brother Nee's, belonging in your heart, in all of our hearts, to have our Lord's table meeting and, and the other meetings of the church uplifted to the utmost, to be matching what he's done for us, to be matching what he is to us and to be matching what we have in us through our experience of him. This will have these are incentives to cause us to rescue, to retrieve, to bring back from distraction all of our experiences of our daily life experiences until we're living Christ, living in him as the all-inclusive one, fulfilling the old testament types of the good land. God's holy people, making a way for him to bring us into the kingdom and then into the eternal age as his bride and as his wife. Praise the Lord. Now, the other messages with this as a background, we'll see in particular ways, in particular, from particular perspectives, how we can advance this very experience. So, we'll stop here. Let's pray with, with our neighbor and then. Um, Hopefully there's time for some confirmation. Amen.